Okay, let's get this over with. It all began so well. Mine. See, I love that. That's the, the first, actually, it's probably the first piece of delivery, no, the second piece of delivery, where I've gone, yes, that's, that's it. That is Napoleon. We've got two hours of big screen, big budget, Napoleonic War spectacular coming and i for one am massively excited i'm the first to admit when i make a mistake i simply never do oh well played the trailers promised a warts and all napoleon a ballsy josephine a visual spectacle a greatest hits rundown of one of the most compelling stories in history what is this costume you have on this is my uniform Shall we vote? You are just a tiny little brute. There is nothing without me. It failed by almost every conceivable measure. And it had nothing to do with the history, which was handled hysterically badly. It had everything to do with the script and the structure of the film. I have consistently said that we should not have expected the Napoleon movie to be particularly historically accurate. And in that sense, it did meet expectations. This is more historical fantasy than it is biopic. But what we got was so disjointed and bordering on the bizarre that it almost felt like an unintentional comedy. Napoleon seducing Josephine by whining at her like a dog or grunting like a pig, as if Ridley Scott confused the real life Napoleon with the Napoleon from George Orwell's Animal Farm. Rifles with telescopes strapped to them in some kind of weird Call of Duty meets the Napoleonic Wars crossover, and the script itself. Meme-worthy lines like, you only think you're great because you have boats. I mean, why didn't they just go the whole hog and go brap at the end of it? Or, destiny has brought me this lamb chop. This is just a waste of good cinema. What is depressing is that in places, Ridley Scott absolutely delivered. The film is visually stunning. I found the crown of France in the gutter and placed it atop my own head. If you were looking for a film that can take the iconic paintings of the era and turn them into moving images, then this is great. I'm sure there are issues with the uniforms here and there, but in terms of getting a feel for how the period looks, it is fantastic. But in actual fact, the entire film is vastly improved if you just turn the volume off. The editing is so sloppy. Napoleon tells his troops to take positions on the high ground or cut off their retreats, only for his men to charge frontally into melees. One soldier is told not to take a shot on pain of death, but later takes that shot regardless. There are, of course, a myriad of historical issues in this film. The battles are brawls with all the tactical awareness of someone playing Napoleon Total War for the first time. I've mentioned telescopes strapped to rifles. The key people of the era are all caricatures. Most of Napoleon's marshals don't even speak, and it was so integral to his success and the interpretation of his ability and vision on the battlefield. Wellington decries Wellington's egotism and lack of simple good manners, as if the big problem for the Allies was that the Emperor didn't know which knife to use when the fish course was served. Napoleon being chided into adultery by his overbearing mother is absurd for a man who in time took a long string of mistresses and needed very little encouragement. Napoleon himself is cast as some love-struck, overly emotional, horny teenager whose only motivation in life is getting into Josephine's bed in a callous character assassination 
of a depiction that does a gross disservice to the man, his complexities, his motivations, his strengths and his weaknesses. If you look down, you'll see a surprise. Once you see it, you will always want it. Sorcerer of death construction. The Battle of the Pyramids lasts literally one artillery salvo before the Ottoman commander is killed by falling masonry as the pyramid top crumbles. And as everyone keeps saying, the battle took place nowhere near them, so it was a ludicrous suggestion on top of a complete fabrication. I'm destined for greatness. The Italian campaign is dismissed in a single line about Italy surrendering without a fight. The dead of that campaign would surely have something to say about that. Marengo, Wagram, the Peninsula War, the entire naval campaign, the Prussians for almost the entirety of the film, 1813, 1814, the Battle of Leipzig, literally one of the biggest battles, the biggest battle to be fought before World War I. All are victims of an effort to try and cram far too much into way too short a space of time. This should have been two films, maybe three, as one, it is as though somebody has watched a YouTube shorts reel of some of the big events in Napoleon's life and then tried to create a script off of that 30 second snippet of information. But you know what? I could forgive all of that if it weren't for one very simple thing. A film should entertain. And for all the violent battle scenes, the OK soundtrack, and Joaquin Phoenix and Vanessa Kirby doing their absolute blindest best with a dire script. This film lacks the most fundamental of things. It has no soul. Whatever your views on Napoleon, whether you love him or you loathe him, consider him to be an inspiring example of what can be achieved with limitless ambition or left with disquiet at what can happen when somebody so Machiavellian acquires the reins of power. Napoleon's story has always, will always, excite emotion. And that is part of why his story is so compelling. It touches something deep within us. It awakens emotions that sometimes we didn't even know were there. One way or another, people should have left that cinema feeling something, anything, excitement or disgust. I don't know. And I frankly don't care what. Because my biggest problem with this film is that for the life of me, I cannot answer two simple questions. One, where was the passion? And two, after watching this, why the hell should I care about a guy called Napoleon? This movie doesn't get you invested in Napoleon's rise. It doesn't leave you rooting for him to succeed in the face of allied opposition. It doesn't make you cheer when his empire crumbles, thanks to the coalition. You don't know why this guy was followed all the way to Moscow by half a million men. You don't want to join the Imperial Guard on a do-or-die assault on the Allied Ridge at Waterloo. You don't want the Prussians to come sweeping over the hill to end the battle and save Wellington's army. You don't want Napoleon to stay married to Josephine. You don't care when she dies. And what is so depressing is that there are moments where you see the fleeting flashes of what could have been. When Napoleon returns from Elba and is stopped by troops of the 5th Regiment, Joaquin Phoenix stands there with tears in his eyes and her voice dripping with emotion and beseeches his men, I am melancholy for my home and our victories together. Will you join me? And in those moments, the realisation of the emotional toll of Napoleon's life comes crashing down on the audience, only for it to be ripped away again in the next scene. The romance, the intrigue, the glory, the despair, it is all absent. And that is what makes me angry. More than Ridley Scott pretending to have an informed opinion on what history is. More than any historical inaccuracy. More than the wooden script. The scale of the missed opportunity is what has left fans of the period reeling. Napoleon's story is so full of potential that perhaps the most impressive thing about this movie is that it has done the seemingly impossible. It took one of the greatest true stories in human history and made it dull. All eyes are now on Steven Spielberg's adaptation of Kubrick's screenplay to finally do the Emperor justice.